Today on Low Buck Garage, I pump water into a carburetor. That doesn't look very promising. I pump rust out of an exhaust. And I get stuck installing an engine. It's slowly sinking on me. I'm going to be getting this truck ready to install the new engine in it. Last time when I was taking one out, I had some issues with this grill. So I'm going to see what I can remove to make it a little easier to go in and make sure I line up the transmission. Now the transmission's already in there, so i got to make a straight shot into it in order to get it to all line up. Now some stuff's going to be easy to remove because it's already not attached. Uh, other stuff is going to be a little more tricky. Whoever installed these fenders welded them directly to the body. So these are not coming off. So I'm going to try to take off the center section, leaving the fenders in place. Easy to remove hood. Now here we have a long rusty bolt with a regular blade screwdriver head. Using a screwdriver bit inside a wrench to try to turn these. This is the times when you really are happy when a bolt snaps. I wonder if I can attach this to an impact. Yeah. Almost there. Got it. Just a little bit of wear. That's fine. Figured out what that plate is for. That's for holding bolts and tools while you take apart the front end. It's perfect. All right. Ah, we have it. That wasn't that bad. Got a lot more room to put that engine in now. So let's look at what we got to do here. A um, little bit of cleanup. That's no big deal. The wiring is all completely terrible. There is no bit of wiring on this that is any good at all. I'm just going to rip out all that wiring. I don't want to use any of it. Uh, we'll just put everything fresh. That's the battery box I cut to get the motor out. I think I'm just going to trim off the edge to even it up and uh, leave that all as is. Uh, transmission, just got to knock a little bit of the dirt off. Now with all this access I have here, this is the perfect time to paint the engine compartment. So I'm not going to do that. I actually thought about painting it I was going to go with a dark brown to try to go with an earth tone, rusty color thing. But the more I look at it, the more I see there's a lot of history in here. Uh, there's the original civilian cab paint. There's a lot of olive drab paint. There's the yellow that someone put on it. Those look like factory original drips of olive drab. This thing is basically perfect as is. I think painting would actually make it worse. So we're going to leave it, move on to the next step. I feel like I'm an archaeologist going to uncover some kind of ancient artifact in here. Huh. There we go. That was stuck a little bit. Turns now though. Now I'm going to add a little grease to this sleeve where the throw up bearing rides, the spline where the clutch disc is supposed to move, and uh, this pilot where it's going to go into the bearing and the crankshaft. I was just climbing in and out of this engine compartment using this nice sturdy looking cross member as a brace. It's thick metal. It's riveted with some nice big rivets on both sides. And yeah, it's totally loose. Those rivets are sheared off. Only one of those is actually attached and that one's pretty loose. It looks like at some point someone tried to weld this back on and the weld broke. So uh, I'm going to need to fix that. I got to put the throw up bearing in here before I install the engine. And I have my old one, but I decided that that didn't sound quite right. That one will probably go catastrophically wrong in about 45 seconds of use. So I went and popped the 15 bucks or so for a brand new one. Now I already have the fork in here. I loaded it up with an excessive amount of grease, so that'll be all over the place soon. 
and we're going to pop this together. This is going to want to fall off almost immediately as soon as I let go of it. I got a piece of safety wire. The key thing is make sure you don't put the wire on something you're going to clamp down a position or cover up so you can take it off afterwards. That's not something you want to learn the hard way. There we go. Now it's on there fairly secure. I'll be able to wiggle it a little bit as I go, but uh, it shouldn't fall off on me. Here's another great learn from my mistakes moment. I'm really close to putting this in, except I can't actually drive the forklift any further forward because the fork's gonna hit the firewall. I'm kind of stuck where I can't go in, I can't go down, and um, it's not lined up. So now I gotta figure out what else to do. I dragged out an official engine hoist because um, they're supposed to do this kind of thing. It totally doesn't work. Uh, the arms that reach nearly enough to even get to the center of this engine. You know how on forklifts with good hydraulics, they hold their position nice and steady? I don't have good hydraulics. It's slowly sinking on me. So uh, now I have a time crunch too. So I'll just spend the time talking to you on the camera instead of actually doing something here. But uh, I guess I should do something eventually. Looks like I got all the problems solved here. Let me show you what I got. We've got a wood block with a floor jack on it. And that goes all the way up to the oil pan. So basically the back of the engine is teetering on that jack. But for stability, I've hooked the engine hoist to the top front of the motor. Now this goes to the top front. So in theory, the center of gravity should be somewhere below this, so it shouldn't fall over. Neither one of these new hoisting devices is mobile, which means I'm gonna have to move the truck into the engine. And uh, yeah, everything looks fine. So let's get the forklift out of here and keep going. We're starting to line things up here, so I guess this is progress. Now, in order to move this truck, I came up with a setup. We're using the ratchet and the strap to pull from the bumper to this pry bar to twist the wheels forward in an exact control to mount. Well, here's my current problem. The input shaft is down low in the bell housing, so the engine needs to drop down. However, this motor mount needs to go here, over this rib. So it needs to go up. And on that other side, it's already pretty much touching, so I can't really get any twist. So I think the only solution is to take the transmission and try to go up with it. Oh yeah, there we go. We're making progress. That was good. Doing a lot of wiggling and pulling. But we're pretty darn close. So close. I almost taste it. Definitely smells like old gear oil. Probably tastes the same too. Front motor mount is in. That lined up. The rear mounts are very close, but I still got a gap to the transmission. But that means I can drop this motor all the way down in position and then just wiggle the transmission that way. Oh, that jumped a little more. It's in there. We have potential of driving someday when I get everything hooked up. That'll take a while. Now I want to add some gear to this transmission because I figure that's a better choice than the water that came out of it. Oh yeah, nice clear water. The easy way to fill them is you can pop off these shifters. Usually you sort of push down and turn. There we go. Then we wiggle. Wiggle some more. Get the dust off there. There. This also gives us an opportunity to check out that reverse lockout feature. This hand, I'm gonna pull. When I pull the lever, it moves that collar up and down. And that's how we get our reverse lockout. Now I'm already seeing rust in there just from the edges. So I'm not gonna to look too closely because then I might feel obliged to fix something. And I don't wanna get into the transmission yet. So we're just gonna pour oil in. How much? I have no idea. But I left the bottom two bolts out to hold the transmission on. And I think when oil starts coming out of those, we should be good. 
Oh, there, it's coming out. All right, we got a mess going. We're gonna pop those bolts in real fast. The quick and easy way to fill a transmission. We definitely have the entire lower shaft covered in oil, and that's gonna throw oil everywhere. So we're in pretty good shape. Turns into place. All right, shifter's in. Now, I'm gonna take a guess that first gear, uh, second gear, how about we go reverse? We know what reverse is, we have to pull the lock out. So there's reverse gear. I am gonna hit the starter, crank this motor over, make sure it turns freely, and the truck should drive backwards slightly, which will indicate that everything's hooked up. So let's see how that works. All right, motor turns over, but the vehicle doesn't move. So it could be the transfer case is in neutral. All right, that's turning. Oh, we moved. Yep, now this is a perfect time to figure out the cooling fan situation because uh, I don't have one. Now these older style Stobolt Chevys use a slightly different type than the standard one. Uh, the Pilot is one inch diameter, usually they're five eighths on anything modern, like from the 50s on up. And the bolt holes are further apart than normal. Luckily, I hoard fans, of course. So I went through my stash and found some likely candidates. I've got a fixed fan, which uh, this is, it's a, what, seven blade? So that would definitely move some air. The Pilot is the modern style, so that doesn't fit. The bolt pattern's the wrong style and uh, it'll hit the harmonic balancer. So this is not a good option yet. I could probably modify a spacer to make it work, but uh, let's look at other options. Now here's a thermostatic fan, same standard modern mounting 5 8 pilot and the holes drilled, I think they're a little over two inches across. And that looks about right for spacing, but I'd have to bore the pilot out and I'd have to re-drill these holes there's no real good way to hold this in a machine to drill them. Now here's another thermostatic fan, and I was real hopeful about this one because it doesn't have straight holes for the mounting bolts. It has slots, and I measured it. I can put the bolts out a little bit. It would bolt on fine. All I have to do is modify the pilot, basically put a one inch drill in there, drill it out, fit perfectly. But luckily I didn't do that. I measured the diameter of that extension shaft, and that is right at one inch. If I put a one inch hole here, going to a one inch piece, um, that's gonna break off. Now this one fits perfect. It's got the one inch pilot. It's got the hole spacing exactly where I want it to be. This will bolt directly on. But of course, there's a problem. Notice the difference in the pitch on these. Regular fans are meant to pull air from the front of the vehicle, across the engine and out the back, which is the angle this has. This fan is from a skid steer. It's meant for a rear engine application. So if I put this on, as it spins, it is gonna push the air forward against the direction of travel. As soon as you start driving down the road, this is blowing forward, air is coming in, you're not gonna get any airflow at all. So the one that fits absolutely perfectly, I can't use. Which means I gotta come up with more options. Now I'm gonna take a look at this broken rivet issue before I mount the radiator because the radiator mounts right here and I can't get to it afterwards. So, I know for sure those rivets are broken. I feel some heads in the bottom. Hopefully they just pop out and I can replace them with bolts. I can see a faint circle there now. There we go. Now this one's still in there so I gotta remove it before I can get all the other ones on this side out. It worked. I got all the rivets driven out of this piece, ready to put some bolts in. Got that brace in, and I don't have a good solution for the fan, so I'm gonna completely ignore that problem for now and keep moving forward. Here's our next piece. Looks like I need some bolts too. These were completely missing before. This has a square slot, which usually indicates you need some type of a carriage bolt. And I found these in my bin. They've got little ribs on them that look like they'll act like a carriage bolt, so I'm gonna use them. Don't remember where they came from though. If anyone knows where these bolts came from, let me know, because I can't remember what I took them off of. I got the pedal assembly bolted back to the bell housing where it's supposed to be. 
Haven't tried pressing it even yet. Let's hit the clutch first. That feels fairly normal. I like how the cap says, use GMC brake fluid. I uh, don't have any of that lying around. We got rust, lots of rust. So let's pour fluid in it and see if it works anyway. Now let's see if there's any chance the pedal moves. The pedal does move. It's moving a little too easy. I'm guessing that piston is stuck all the way in. Oh yeah, there's no pressure on that. And it looks like we can take off the back of the master cylinder. So we might be able to punch the piston this way and free it up. But we'll let it soak for a little first. There's one thing I always run into with all my older vehicles. The steering wheel, you touch it, turns your hand black. Clear spray paint. A couple coats of this, let it dry and your steering wheel is uh, touchable again. And you don't really have to worry about masking stuff because it's clear. You won't see it. Now before I go and put the radiator in here, I've got really good access to the fuel pump. If you saw when I tried to start it, that fuel pump didn't pick up fuel from a tank and pump it to the carburetor. It was trying to draw up out of the tank. Now it could be the valves aren't sealing quite perfect because it's been sitting a long time, or the uh, system I had had vacuum leaks and it was drawing air, not liquid. So I want to make sure I have a pump that works before I put that radiator in and block all my access. So I've come up with the standard test rig. Now this is a brake fluid bottle cut in half with a gear oil end on it going to hose going to the fuel pump. And the basic idea is we want that gasoline above the fuel pump so gravity feeds into it. We know that pump for sure has fuel in it. Then when it starts moving the diaphragm, it's either going to pump fuel or it's going to leak, one or the other. So we know where to go from there. Now I used a DOT3 bottle. Uh, DOT4 or 5 would probably work. But if you're into purity, use the top of a gear oil bottle so that the nozzle is the same as the bottle itself. You may not want to mix these together. But I'm going to give this one a shot and we'll see how it works. I set, let this sit for a little bit just to see the level. If it started dropping at high speed, I know it was probably leaking past the fuel pump diaphragm into the crankcase. So that would be bad. But it stayed pretty steady, so I think we're okay to give it a shot. Absolutely nothing. Oh, got fuel up top here. Let's try that one more time. Well, since we have fuel here, let's give a shot to starting it up and see what happens then. run it too long because I uh, didn't want to heat it up too much. Now, I ran the motor pretty briefly and that's what collected in the fuel filter. That is probably what was keeping our fuel pump from working was all that junk inside the pump that is now pumped into the filter and soon will be pumped to the carburetor. Hopefully this filter works well. Now I'm gonna have you guys keep an eye on that fuel pump when I start it up again. We'll see what all that junk in the bottom does. <laughs> That doesn't look very promising. I think I'm going to change out that fuel pump. I disconnected the supply line there and 
all the fuel of the filter drained back immediately. So I think those check valves are still not working right. Really, you only allow fuel to go this way, but that filter drained out like nothing was stopping it and left uh, a little bit of residue. Luckily, I pulled the one off the old engine. Now I tried this one out with the scientific test of squeezing it and it makes noises like it's gonna pump. So I'm gonna throw this on and assume it's gonna work fine. I'm glad I'm changing this before I uh, put the radiator in. It's a lot easier to reach through here. Oh yeah, this is much easier. Rather than make the engine compartment shiny with fresh paint, I'm gonna make the one shiny part I have, this brand new radiator, unshiny with semi-gloss paint. So time to de-shine. They usually supply a cap that is way too high of a pressure. You can buy them in lower spring rates, or you can just modify these. I'm just peeling out the extra bit of spring. There we go. Now we have less spring pressure, which means less radiator pressure. So uh, that'll work better. The original radiator mounted on bolts that are inside this frame here. I've never seen one installed but it looks like the radiator goes into this frame and then the flange of the side bolts there. It actually fits inside the shell on the bottom, but then on the top, it's just a little bit. Now I could notch this frame out and drop that down a little bit further. And this isn't too far off. So a little bit down, maybe a little notch here, that would fit in. But then the filler neck would have to go right in this part. And I could notch that and then add a reinforcement that bolts on the back side. So this radiator could be pushed forward into this shell if I wanted to. But looking at it, I've got about two inches of clearance between the radiator and the water pump anyway. So I think I'm okay at this distance. So I'm just going to make some mounts that go from this frame to that flange and uh, bolt it in and see what we got. I'm going to use some angle material to make my radiator adapter. And uh, I already laid this one out and marked it. Uh, the second time I made my marks, I actually put them in the right spot. That takes a while to lay everything out and center punch it and drill it and get everything in the right location. But I've done it once and I got to make four pieces just like this that are totally symmetric. So I don't want to do this again. I'm just going to take one piece with holes in it, clamp it to another piece that doesn't have holes in it, and use this as a drill guide through the next piece. So that way I'm going to copy the same hole pattern in every single piece and I don't need to measure any of them or mark any of them or do any kind of proper stuff at all. This will be quick and easy. Now I took my two pieces of angle and made a zigzag spacer adapter out of them. Now I actually bolted these two pieces together because I have no idea this is going to work. I don't have a fan yet, so I may be changing this around. Normally I would just weld these two pieces together, but I figure by bolting it, I can unbolt it and move around and then weld it together. Or I can just leave it exactly as is and never touch it again, which is my best solution. Now this adapter is gonna bolt in the factory mounts, no changes to the front at all. And then we'll bolt the radiator in. One other problem I ran into with my $168 radiator, it didn't come with a uh, drain valve. I just threw a plug in, cause that's what I had. But uh, I usually expect those to come with a radiator. Oh well. Now this corner is about level with the radiator support, but the hood goes up, so we should be good there. Uh, we look okay on the radiator cap clearance. A little bit of a gap between the tank and the uh, support, so it's not going to be rubbing. We've got a little gap underneath it on both corners. The flanges line up with everything pretty nicely in here. We still have a gap to the water pump, so we should be good there. I think we're ready to bolt this thing in. Now the mounting flange of this radiator came without any holes at all. So if you're buying it for the right application, you'd probably be annoyed at having to drill holes. But I rarely use these for the right application, so it's perfect for me. I just drill them wherever. As I was drilling into this radiator, I was thinking, you know, I really don't want this drill to slip. Once it goes through, I might actually smash the battery into the radiator. So I'm going to employ the old uh, rubber hose trick. And take this, slide it over my drill bit. That way, I can only go that far and hit the hose. Now I can press into it good. There, perfect. On the lower hose, I have to go from a large diameter out, up, and then to a slightly smaller diameter. So basically I need to start off small, go out, angle, down, 90 to bigger. I've been going through my boxes of hoses. 
I have a couple of them that are the right diameter of large on one end and smaller on the other, but none with the right shape. But I did find one with the right diameter for the bottom with the 90 I need, one with the right diameter for the top with the angle I need. Now the interesting thing I found about radiator hoses, when you step from one size to the next size down, the outside of the smaller one fits in the inside of the bigger one. So all we have to do is connect this in a way that doesn't leak too badly, and we should be good. I've got my connector from the water pump down. Then I've got my 90 for the radiator and the next size. Now the key thing to this whole operation is a piece of tubing. I found an old scrap of exhaust tubing that was just the right size to fit inside here. And basically what you're doing here is you're making this tube rigid so you can clamp on it. We slide this piece of tubing over top of it. Now I can clamp down real hard on this hose clamp. That sleeve inside there is going to hold the shape of the ID and we can compress these two walls together to make a real good seal. It actually seems to seal better than uh, just rubber on metal. The rubber on rubber seems to do really well. So we got ourselves a lower hose with two different diameters. Let's go throw it on. Got the bottom on. Top is in. We got a lower hose. This thermostat housing came with this engine, but it points to the side and my radiator inlet's straight in the middle. So I can't use this one. Luckily I had spares. And this one points straight up right to that opening. So uh, we should be in good shape for just a little curved hose. Of course, that diameter is smaller than that one. So I'm gonna need an adapter here. I have a piece of hose that fits this one. And you may have noticed this one's a little bit short, won't quite reach. So I'm gonna extend it with the next size up. We'll just shove this on here. And then shove this on here. And now we get to find out if we have any leaks. Got a bit of a leak on the uh, thermostat housing there. Probably should have used a new gasket. Might need to get one of those. We're gonna try just tightening it down a little bit and see if that works. Ah, oh, seems to slow down. circulating we got it up to temperature and uh, we'll shut it off let it cool overnight and see what we got in the morning I've got a lot of details to take care of before I actually get this thing moving under its own power but there's one extremely critical detail the stack I got to install this now when I got this truck there was a dual exhaust system Obviously I'm gonna save these glass packs. Looks like the standard universal 70s pickup truck dual exhaust system. Uh, obviously not from this vehicle, but that has mufflers. And one of them doesn't have rust holes in it. So I'm gonna use that one. And between the two of them, I got a lot of bends to piece together to make the routing of this whole thing. These things are a treasure trove of clamps and hangers. Oh, I got the glass pack without rust holes, safely tucked inside the stack, connected to the top, and got a couple bolts here that this can drop on and locate securely. So now, it's just a matter of going under. Because this is not gonna be the cosmetic stack. This thing needs to function. I wanna see rust blowing out of the end of this thing. I ran out of two inch couplers, so I was digging through my box of exhaust stuff and I found a leftover bit of an elbow. I kept the end that had been swedged open so I can cut this off and use this as a coupler for two inch tubing. 
Also, I needed a 90 degree elbow, but I had already cut this one off. Went through my stash of old exhaust pipes, found the right diameter with a 90 in it. I spent a while making up all sorts of zigzags and things, but I think I'm ready to finally put it all together. This piece goes up here, and we undo the bailing wire over here, drop this one down. Luckily I left pretty much everything a slip fit, and I won't need to actually weld this up until I get it driving. When I get it driving, I can drive it to the welder. So that'll be better. Oh, dirt in the face. There we go. There we are. All I have to do is tighten up this muffler hanger and we're on. We get the head pipe going to a connector, going up, going to another connector, going over, coming out there. This clamp is actually bolted through the body, so that's on there sturdy. Then go to another 90. This is the end of that bend, so there was no center notch to hold it in place. So I welded one end and that slipped on. Then we go up. Those bolts are bolted to this bed. At some point I'll put a plate and nut on top of them. Then we go up, all the way to the end. And the whole thing's on there. Now I gotta do some wiring so I can fire this up again. Or I just use the alligator clip. Maybe I'll use the alligator clip. I wanna hear this. Gotta get a close up sound. Still needs a little bit of a tune up, but I like that. Now, this stack is cool, but it's particularly important to me to have this on a vehicle and running. Because when I was a kid, that stack was in my dad's parts stash. I've never seen it attached to a vehicle, but it was always sitting on a shelf or sitting in a pile, and I thought it was the coolest exhaust ever. And about 20 years ago, I got it from him, and I was supposed to put it on something, and I never got it done. It's actually been a lifelong dream of mine. Uh, a fairly small dream, but my entire life I wanted to see that stack on a vehicle driving. And now it's done. I really appreciate you guys supporting this channel, because it helps me do stuff like that. We're starting to hook up the ignition system, something a little better than this uh, alligator clip. And the main reason is I couldn't reach this alligator clip from inside the vehicle. So if I tried to drive it, I couldn't shut it off. Other than that, this is working great. But while I was doing the wiring, I added a ballast resistor. Normally I try to use the coils that don't need an external resistor. They've got a little higher internal resistance and so they can run on a full 12 volts. That way you don't have to wire in extra stuff. This coil I already had, and it needs an external resistor, and it was cheaper to buy the resistor than to buy another coil. I dug around for a little bit to find the cheapest resistor I could. Uh, it was around five bucks locally. So now I've got a wire for the ignition system. I need to hook it up to something. I'm gonna try out the factory switch here, see if I can get that working. There we go. This wasn't even hooked up. Wonder what they're using for ignition switch. This is a lock nut that held on that switch. It looks like orange paint under there. So this truck may have been orange at one point. Adds a little more to the mystery of the mutt truck. Got a meter to test the switch. Looks like it works. We're having another learn from my mistakes moment. I went to hook up the throttle linkage. The throttle linkage bell crank goes right there directly behind this exhaust that I just installed. So, um, I gotta take this off. Install the throttle linkage first, then do the exhaust. Luckily, my bin for old rusty cotter pans is right next to my bin for old used springs. So this is like one stop shopping for all your throttle linkage needs. I'll take one of these, and one of these. Oh yeah, that looks good. I don't know where this is actually supposed to go, but I found a little tab on the linkage and then another tab in the steering box and well, it seems to return on its own. So I'm going to call this good. I got the throttle bell crank hooked up and that fancy linkage hooked back up and that all looks like it's going to work once I have something to, you know, press on, which 
is back here. Now this floor wasn't really attached when I took it out. Looks like a lot of the bolt holes ripped through. Whoever invented the self-tapping screw, I thank them very much. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Let's show a quick review of where we're at. I've got power for the ignition system with absolutely no fuses at all going uh, into the dashboard area. No battery tie down, of course. Uh, we have a boat tank. This one is pretty secure. I wrapped the fuel line around the headlight, so that should hold that tank in place fine. There's a clutch pedal that seems like it might do something. A brake pedal that seems like it will not do anything. And a gas pedal that has a possibility of doing something. Couldn't get the pin to line up at all. I don't know if it's because of the different motor, the belt cranks in a different spot, but it seems like the back side of the pedal just pushes on the end and that works fine. So, uh, yeah, something like that. I still got a lot of work to do, but I don't want to do it right now. So let's try to drive it. That should be fun. Get to enjoy the nice bucket seat. All right, I think I'm in neutral. Yeah. Foot almost hits the drive shaft, that's okay. All right, ignition on. Oh, throttle sticks all the way to the floor. That could be an issue. Apparently my return spring wasn't very good. All right, as long as you don't hit it all the way down, it returns. So uh, we'll deal with fixing that later. Starts pretty good. It works. Just because that truck isn't roadworthy doesn't mean it can't be useful. Now on this side on the front, there are two tires that don't hold air. Those are the ones I experimented with grooving. And I have a job that normally I'd use my battery powered tire grooving tool for, but I'm gonna see if this will work. Those broken pallets need to be turned into kindling. I think four-wheel drive is working. I don't know, maybe. Drive's over that. The tire has a pretty good amount of flex when it has absolutely no air. This truck is great. I have a lot of fun with it, both working on it and driving over stuff with it. So I'm ending the video here and calling it a total win. There's a lot more to do on this truck and a lot more fun to be had. So you'll be seeing it again for sure. Hope you guys are having fun in your projects and we'll see you next time. I really gotta drive this thing around some more just to uh, warm up the oil. Warm up the oil so I can change it. That's why I gotta drive it around. Ah! 
I just got a box from uh, Dave at World War II Restorations. Let's see what we got. It's a actual metal glove box. There's more goodies. Right, we got that. Ah, we have a full set of seals and a gasket set for the transfer case and some tips for putting them in. Nice. I guess I don't have an excuse to have it leak oil anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate it. These will be installed. Looks like I'm going to be doing some interior work soon. Probably the next video. Oh yeah, that'll be nice.